How are we doing this morning? All right. So I know there's people still coming in. So if you have room that way, either one way or the other, just make sure there's some, if there's seats around you empty, make sure people can get to them. How about that? We'll do it that way. All right. We can pull out chairs if we need to. Uh, But it is great to see you this morning. And look, you know what? I I try to get up here because um, I just want you to be aware that we believe church should be fun, right? How do you feel about that? All right, good deal. Because if we're here and we're bored to death, what good does that do, right? So what we want you to do is be comfortable. If, if you're, there are going to be some great worship songs. If you want to stand up and raise your hands, if you want to sit down, if you want to just be, be in silent contemplation, or if you want to jump, uh, we want you to worship as the Lord leads you to worship because we are excited about what God's going to do in this place today, all right? Um, I am so grateful that you're here. If you're our guest today, uh, we would love to have a welcome card filled out on you. Now, um, we're not going to bombard you with a bunch of stuff. We just want to have a record that you're here, and we want to make sure that we at least reach out to you at least one time. So if you've never filled out a card um, or if this is your first time, we would like for you to fill out a card. When you leave and you're going in the hall, there's a little um, wooden TV tray thing there. And there'll be some stuff stacked on it. Jana and Kevin McCandless will be standing there. If you'll give them your card, they will give you a gift. And it's a pretty nice gift. So we would love for you to do that for us just so we can get to know you a little better. Thank you so much for being here today. Let's stand together and worship our Lord. I wandered so aimless, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like the stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the
Have a seat. We're going to watch a short video. The compassion of Jesus is the compassion of Almighty God. And Jesus says to your heart and mind tonight, don't ever be so foolish as to measure my compassion for you in terms of your compassion for one another. Don't ever be so silly as to compare your thin, pallid, wavering, moody, dependent on smooth circumstances, human compassion with mine, for I am God as well as man. When you read in the Gospels that Jesus was moved with compassion, it is saying his gut was wrenched 
his heart torn open, the most vulnerable part of his being laid bare. The ground of all being shook. The source of all life trembled, the heart of all love burst open, and the unfathomable depths of the relentless tenderness was laid bare. Your Christian life and mine don't make any sense unless in the depth of our beings we believe that Jesus not only knows what hurts us, but knowing seeks us out, whatever our poverty, whatever our pain. His plea to his people is come now wounded, frightened, angry, lonely, empty, and I'll meet you where you live. And I love you as you are, not as you should be, because you're never going to be as you should be. Do you really believe this? That with all the wrong turns you made in your past, the mistakes, the moments of selfishness, dishonesty, and degraded love, do you really believe that Jesus Christ loves you? Not the person next to you, not the church, not the world, but that he loves you beyond worthiness and unworthiness, beyond fidelity and infidelity. That he loves you in the morning sun and the evening rain without caution, regret, boundary, limit, no matter what's gone down, he can't stop loving you. This is the Jesus of the Gospels. Stand back up if you feel like you want to. Yeah. 
thinking I've got a you know we're doing 21 days of prayer here and so if you look up there you see things that have been put on the cross and you can still do that but that is things that people are giving up they're fasting from so some people are fasting from lunch um, and they're going to use that time to focus on prayer we have a sheet that has the prayer focuses for each day um, basically just praying for our church for 2020 Um, and some people like myself fasting from social media you don't have to fast from food necessarily we're doing that, but along with that, if you have the uh, YouVersion Bible app, there's a 21 days of prayer devotional that you can access, and I did that, and one of the things that, um, one of the days that I really found interesting was it talked about the fact that in Genesis, God said, let there be, and there was. If you look at the New Testament, um, everywhere Jesus went, he did things that people would have thought impossible, and so in the devotional, it said, what is it in your life that you need to change from let there from it can't be to let there be? Because for some of us, I mean, if we're honest, there's a lot of it can't be in our life. I, I can't serve, I can't do this, I can't do that. But if we just let go and say, all right, God, let there be. Because I can do anything in your power and your strength. And I don't know, maybe it's some very serious situations going on in your life and in your mind today that you're just struggling with. You just are struggling if you're honest. And I don't want you to come forward. I don't want you to do any of that. But I'm just going to ask you, if look, if you need something to be changed from it can't be to let there be, just I'm just going to ask you to have a seat where you are. Um, so that we can focus on praying for you during this time. You don't have to tell us what it is or say anything. You know why? Because God knows all that. So if there's something in your mind, in your heart, you would say, it can't be. Um, and you need it to be let there be. Then I'm just going to ask you to have a seat. For the rest of us, if there's something that um, you want to focus on, we've got a place up here you can pray. But if you're close to somebody who is seated... Uh, I'm just going to ask you to, uh, those people around them, just to touch them, and we're going to pray um, for them. So let's pray together right now.
God, we come before you right now. And God, for those of us in this room that are seated right now, we understand that some things in life are bigger than us. And in our heart, maybe in our mind, we feel like it just can't be that it's too big for me. Well, the truth is it is too big for us, but it's not too big for you. And so right now, God, we pray that whatever needs to happen, that you would intervene. You would make it happen. Not so that we can brag that something good happened, but so that you get the glory. That's ultimately what we want. We want you to get the glory. In this place today, Father, there are broken people. There are hurting people. There are people who are struggling with things they can't even mention. But, God, through your Holy Spirit, through the power of your word, through the transforming power of who you are, lives can be changed in this place, God. Today we can see real life change. That's what we want. If we come and just do church as usual, then we've done nothing. But if the Holy Spirit of God pours out on us today and lives are transformed and changed, then we've done something for, for good. We've, we've done something that you get the glory for. And today, God, we ask that you speak. You speak. You continue to speak through the songs. You continue to speak um, through the love that we have for one another. And you speak through the, through the words, uh, through the message of your word this morning. And you get the glory. As we stand in silence, you are speaking to hearts. And you are already changing lives. Thank you, God, that you love us enough change us. Thank you, God, that you love us so much that no matter what we do, you are still here. Help us to see you in all your glory. Thank you, God. It is in the precious holy name of Jesus that we pray all these things. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Yeah. 
struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. I tell you, there's nothing more, uh, I don't know, heart filling for me than to stand up here and to hear the, the volume of singing coming from you guys. It does my heart good as a pastor um, to get to experience that. So I thank you guys for being willing to, to sing praises to the king. So take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, I know what you're thinking. Uh, we're going to get a sermon on love. Well, guess what? We're going to get a sermon on love, sort of. Um, and so um, we, are, we are in our series called The Spirit-Filled Life. And, you know, at Crossroads, one of the things that we, we believe, right, if, you, if you're walking in the door and you happen to look up, if you've never done it, look above the door coming in here, and you know what we believe, right? It, it's right on the door. Anybody know what it abo- says above the door? So, all right, what is it? Live by faith, be, and what? Reach those far. We want to live by faith, be known by love, and reach those far from God. That's why we exist, to do those things. And you can say, well, doesn't every church? No. No, I mean, I'm not joking, right? It's easy for, and I, I'm not slamming all the churches. We, but that is exactly what God has called us to do, to live by faith, be known by love, and to reach those far from God. And if you're not careful, you can get all that twisted. Right? Uh, you, can, you can be wanting to be known by love so much that you get away from what the Bible says, if you're not careful. You can stick so closely to the letter of the law that you miss being able to reach people far from God. There, there's a balance there that we have to try to navigate as followers of Christ. And I want you to know that we at Crossroads believe the Bible. And the reason that we're talking about this idea of the spirit-filled life is because it's in the Bible. And we can't just the, the parts that make us uncomfortable, we can't just ignore those parts, right? We've got to kind of try to figure that stuff out because God put it in there for our benefit. And so we've been looking at the gifts of the Spirit. 
Now, if, um, well, I tell you what, let's, let me read this. You follow along in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to read the whole chapter um, because most of you have only heard this in the context of a marriage, right? You've only heard it in that context. So we're going we're gonna to read it. You follow along. If you don't have your Bible, bring your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, let me know. We will get you a Bible. But if you don't have it, you can look on the screen. We're going to have it there. and let's, I'll read and you follow along. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. Now, we're going to be getting to that in chapter 14, so just hang on, all right? So that means you got to be here. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. Woo, that's getting a little too close to home, isn't it? It is not irritable or resentful. Love is. Uh, it does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. And as for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish things. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. But then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, that, there's nothing, listen, when I said that about you've only heard in the context of marriage, that's true, most of us only have heard in the context of marriage. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of scriptures that can be used in a variety of ways, okay? So if you, I don't want anybody sitting here to go, today to go, oh, something's wrong with my marriage because they used that in my, in my marriage vows. No, there's nothing wrong with your marriage, that's okay, that's a good thing. But I just want you to understand that marriage is not the essential reason Paul put this here. And if you're looking into these chapter 12, 13, and 14, where you're gonna, it's going to appear to you, if you're not careful, is that Paul is chasing a rabbit. Because in chapter 12, Paul is saying, hey, here's the gifts of the Spirit, right? There's prophecies, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, and healing that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Remember, all of those things, though, we have to be sure that we understand. All of those things are not ours. They are gifts of the Spirit, and we can't just access them at will. Right, this all, especially healing, and we have to know that God. You can be, you can pray for healing, and somebody can be healed. That's a gift of healing. You can pray for somebody, and they're not healed. Right, that that's God's choice. So all those things he's talking about, all those things in chapter twelve, and then in chapter thirteen, he is he didn't lose his train of thought and start talking about love, and then in chapter fourteen go, oh, let me get back on track. No, there's a reason for that. He had a purpose in doing that. And so um, it, is, it is very clear that why he was doing that in Corinth at this time, you had a lot of people who were utilizing the gifts of the Spirit and, and believed things about the gifts of the Spirit that were untrue. And you're saying, we're we going to get to love. Yes, we are. Just hold on a second. We're going to get there. But there's a, they were believing things about the gifts of the Spirit that were untrue. And here's the problem. We see those same kinds of things today. We see the same things today that they were trying to, they, they had to deal with in the church at Corinth all those years ago. Isn't that funny? Still dealing with the same kinds of things. First, they believed wrongly that if you exercised, if you had a spiritual gift, that that meant you were, you were more mature of a believer than somebody else. Now, we deal with that, right? We hear people say, well, I'm a more spiritual Christian. Because I have lived out one of these gifts of the Spirit. That can be a very 
um, kind of a dangerous thing, right? Or some of them believed superiority, that it made them better than somebody else. And we all know that that's a really dangerous road to travel down, right? If you begin to believe that you're better than anybody else, that can be a very dangerous road for us to travel down. Um, some of them believe this, that whichever, if you had a spiritual gift that you were able to use, that meant that God loved you more than somebody else. Now, if you've been at Crossroads for more than, more than twice, <laughs> you have heard us talk about the fact that God loves you. You heard it this morning on the video, right? God loves you just as you are, not as you should be. Now, we, we should have a desire to get where we should be, but God loves us if we never get there. And that is so hard for us to comprehend. I'm not going to get ahead of myself because we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes, right? And then the last thing that they believed, and we still deal with it today, is they, there were people out there exploiting other people for, for gain, for profit, by the gifts. And we've seen that as well. And it's a dangerous thing. And so Paul is responding to all of these things. He talks about the gifts of the Spirit in chapter 12. And now in chapter 13, he's responding. There's a response to that. Right? Here's what the gifts of the Spirit are, but here's the, here's the danger, and here's why. And Paul is responding to all these people, basically saying, if love for others does not control and shape how you live, regardless of what gifts God gives you, it doesn't really even matter, or what gifts you think you have, then it is worth than it is worse than worthless. It's dangerous. If you do not have love for other people, then it doesn't matter what gifts you have. It is worse than worthless. It is dangerous. And that's the message of chapter 13. That's why Paul put it in here. He is trying to help these Corinthians understand that you can do everything you think. I mean, he even says, I, Paul. He's not talking about, he doesn't say we. He doesn't use generalities. He says, I, Paul. I, listen, we know Paul spoke in tongues. We, I, Paul, if I do these things, if I have a word of knowledge or if I can speak prophecies, all those things, he says, listen, it is not just that the idea is bad. He says, I, Paul, am worthless. I am like a clanging gong or a crashing cymbal. It's, it's worthless. And so what he's saying is this. If I do it without love, not only is the idea worthless, but somehow I, Paul, am corrupted. That's why it's dangerous. Because somehow I, Paul, or put fill in the blank, anybody who thinks that having these, being able to do something in the spirit somehow makes them special. Paul's saying it doesn't make you special, especially if, especially if you don't love other people, it is worthless. Now listen, I'm not saying spiritual gifts aren't blessings. They are. Spiritual gifts are blessings, but compared to the value of love, they are incomplete, useless part of the Christian life. Because at the very end, we're going to get there in a minute, but I'm going to jump ahead. At the very end, what does he say? These three things about love. Uh, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You mean love is greater than faith? How is that possible without faith? I can't even uh, receive Christ for salvation. How is love greater than faith? Because it was love who sent Christ to the cross. If there hadn't have been that love, we wouldn't have any reason for faith. And if he didn't go to the cross and die, he wouldn't have went to the tomb and he wouldn't have risen again and we wouldn't have any reason for hope. It's all because of love. Now I got off track because I got ahead, but that's okay. He's not saying spiritual gifts are bad. Do not hear me say that. He is not saying spiritual gifts are bad. Spiritual gifts are not bad. But what he is saying is that love is not a spiritual gift. Love is a way of life. That's why we said, you know, when we first started this, um, that or in reality, love is more valued than spiritual gifts. Um, spiritual gifts are important, but only when exercised in love. And I think, I, I think, 
I'm right when I tell you this, that Paul is saying that the virtues of the fruits of the Spirit should be more valued or more highly thought of than the gifts of the Spirit. Now, remember, when we very first started, what, what did we say? Fruits of the Spirit and gifts of the Spirit are different because fruits of the Spirit are operative in all believers, all of the fruits of the Spirit. So if you're a believer, if you said yes to Jesus, you have all of the fruits of the Spirit at your, at your disposal, right? You have love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, right? You have that at your disposal. All of us do. Now, I didn't say you lived in them. I didn't say you operated in them, but you have them. You can operate them. You can live in them. As a matter of fact, you should. Now, everybody doesn't have all the gifts of the Spirit. Most of you are in here going, oh, I don't know if I have any gifts of the Spirit. You have one. You may not ever figure out what it is, but you have one. I hope you do. We're going to hopefully at the end of this series give you some opportunities to help you out. But look, everybody doesn't have all the gifts of the Spirit. And you don't operate in the gifts of the Spirit at all times. But you should operate in the fruits of the Spirit at all times. You should operate out of love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and self-control all the time. Not only that, you should be maturing in those things. What does that mean? That means tomorrow you should love some people better than you did today. And you should have more self-control. If you, <laughs> Somebody said, nope. <laughs> well, you should. Okay, no. <laughs> but but here's the thing you should Here, here's the thing it, i don't know for some people in here they would say man i've been a believer my whole life well not literally you know you would say that but that's not literally true but it may be 10 years it may be 20 years it may be 30 years ask yourself the question do i love people more today than i did when i first started walking with jesus Am I more self-controlled today than I was when I started walking with Jesus? Am I more faithful today than I was when I started walking with Jesus? Because we should be growing in those things. Why is it important? It's important because it, it di directly relates to how we love people. Lots of people say, I just, I just love people. What they mean when they say that is this. I love the right kind of people. I love people that don't get on my nerves. I love people that don't irritate me, right? Come on. I'm not the only one, right? That's what we mean. I've shared this illustration before, but, um, and I wasn't going to share it, but uh, this morning as I was praying through and looking over, God just really impressed on me this was the perfect place for us to, to share this illustration again because it directly relates to how we love people. Tony Campolo is a, um, a professor, a pastor, an author. Uh, he is a professor of philosophy and religion at Eastern University in Pennsylvania. And he shares a story about having a meeting in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, not Mississippi. Um, and he wasn't at the Neshoba County Fair, sorry. Um, sorry, Ashton, he wasn't at the Neshoba County Fair, buddy. Um, that would be interesting, though. If you've ever seen this, never mind, we'll, we'll get, I, I get off track too easy. Uh, chasing a rabbit, that's okay. Uh, but so Tony Campolo says he had a meeting in, in downtown Philadelphia. He was dressed in a suit. He had been in his meeting. He comes out, and, and out of the corner of his eye, he kind of catches a glimpse of this homeless man. And he said, you know, he's a, he's a pastor of religion. I mean, he's a professor of religion. He's a pastor. He writes Christian books. So he's going to do the right thing, right? Try not to make eye contact and get past him as fast as he can. But he said he didn't take two steps, and he heard this. Hey, mister. Hey, mister. You want a sip of coffee? As he's walking right towards him. And he said he looked like he was wearing everything he owned. And he was holding this styrofoam or paper cup of McDonald's coffee. And he said before he even got to me, I could see the cup was dirty. Like it was just, it was, it was dirty. The rim had his dirt from his mouth on it and he said i thought the last thing i want is a sip of coffee but he said as he got closer the thing that stuck out the most was this massive beard huge man massive beard it had pieces of food rotting in it and he said i don't even want to get started on the smell and he said i, I told him 
Sure, I'll, I'll take a sip of coffee. And he took a small sip of coffee. And he said, I thought to myself, this is going to cost me. And he said, well, you're feeling mighty generous this morning. What would make you want to share your coffee? And he said, well, I got to thinking. When God gives you a delicious cup of coffee, you ought to share it with someone. And he said, I thought, this is going to cost me big time. He is setting me up big time. And so he said, as I'm kind of reaching for my wallet, so you did something nice for me. What can I do for you? And he said, this big man thought long and hard and said, you know, I think I'd like a hug. And he said, I thought, I'd rather give him $10. But he said, before I could do anything, this big man reached out, put both arms around me, and pulled me right into his chest. And my face is in this nasty, dirty beard. And the only thing that I can think about is I'm on the street and there are hundreds of people walking by this, on this busy sidewalk. And I am here in a suit and a tie hugging this homeless man. What in the world are people thinking about me right now? He said, you know, there's an appropriate amount of time for one man to hug another man. Right, Ben? <laughs> not, not bad to hug another man, is it? Just an appropriate amount of time. He said, we went way past that. And all I'm thinking about is, what are people thinking? And he said, but as this man held me in a bear hug, in a vice grip, the thought started to come to my head, as you've done it unto the least of these done it to me and he said the longer I stood there and the longer he held on to me the more I stopped thinking I was hugging a homeless man and I started to feel like I was hugging Jesus why do we need to grow in the fruits of the spirit because right now it is hard for us to imagine that God loves that homeless man as much as he loves us sitting in these, in these seats in this worship room. But he does. He does. Because we need to love people. That's the only way we're going to make an impact on this world. And Paul says, All the rest of the stuff is irrelevant if you don't love my creation. We forget sometimes that we are his most precious creation. And then Paul goes on to tell us 15 characteristics. 15 characteristics of what love is and what love is not. I've said this before. You might have said this before. and You've heard people say it. Love is a choice, not a feeling. I think Paul would argue with us that it's both. That we can't separate them out. Because Paul goes on to say, this is what Christian love is. It is patient. It is kind. It does not envy. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. That one hit me pretty hard. I can be rude sometimes. It does not insist on its own way. Man, aren't we bad about that? Like this I just want what, can't everybody just do what I want? It'd be, life would be so much easier, and we would get along so much better if everybody do just do what Wayne wants. We wouldn't have to argue or anything. We want our own way. Man, just, just be at church every Sunday. <laughs> I want my way. It's not irritable. I get hangry, and I get real irritable, and I feel bad. My wife is really overzealous about that one. 
It's not resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. What does that mean, that you just rejoice in the Bible? Yeah, but it also means that when somebody else experiences truth in their life, they come to an understanding and a knowledge of truth. You rejoice with them. You're excited for them. When somebody comes and and God has done a work in their life, we're excited that that God has done that work in their life. And it is a big deal. Why do you think we've changed up how we do baptism? By the way, April, first Sunday in April, we will be doing baptism. If you want to be baptized, for, you need to talk to me. We've got a form you can fill out. We'll get together. We'll do it. But why? We make a big deal about it. Why? Because it's a big deal. We want to rejoice with you because you understand in greater detail truth. And we rejoice in truth. It always hopes doesn't mean you're completely irrational. It means you don't give up. You don't give up on people. You never give up on people. There is hope because as long as there is breath in our bodies, God can do a work in our lives. And love never ends. It never ends. I got a question for you. Do we love others this way? If we were face-to-face with that homeless man, what would we have done? Because that hug that day might have meant more to him than all the money in the world. Here's the truth. God loves us this way. I, I really believe that It's hard for us to grasp this concept, that God loves you as you are, not as you should be. I I pondered this question for about two hours the other day. And if anybody knows me, sitting, thinking about one question for two hours is a miracle of God. Squirrel, that's me. But I pondered it because I thought, Well, sure, we would all probably say, yeah, sure, God loves me as I am, not as I should be. That makes sense, right? But when you start to drill down, that means this, that God loves me as I am, whether I ever pick up the Bible again or not. See, we really, we may say that intellectually, but in our, in our soul, in our, in our spirit, we kind of think this way, God loves me as I am, As long as I'm going to church, as long as I'm reading the Bible, as long as I'm praying, as long as I'm fill in the blank. The problem with that is this. If we believe that God loves us as long as we're doing that, then we can tell ourselves when we're not doing good, when we're in that deep valley, that he doesn't love us as much as he did. Now, here's the thing. If you love God and you know how much he loves you, you are not going to. I mean, it, it changes you. It changes you. You want, And we say that here all the time, and it's true. God loves you as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. And we mean that. But in your mind, in your heart, you have to believe that God loves you just as you are. Period. Exclamation point. Nothing else. It's that crazy, over-the-top kind of love that we can't understand. Because we try to look at it from our human perspective. You know, because if you continually push me down to the ground, eventually I'm going to be unkind at some point. God's not that way. So just look at our lives. How many times have we stiff-armed God and pushed him away? How many times have we known to do something good and we didn't do it, and yet he still loves us? I believe there's some... People here today that just cannot grasp the fact that God loves them because of all the stuff they've done. And we tell ourselves silly, silly things like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it right. I'm going to get my life cleaned up, and then I'm going to start serving the Lord. I'm going to do. No. You just come to God as you are, and he will change you. You can't do it. You cannot do it. feel like 
if I could just, because it, it took me a long time to believe that God loved me without me having to do something to earn it. And I believe there are people struggling with that same thing. And once you come to this knowledge and once you finally get it, God loves me and I don't have to do anything in return. You know what happens? You begin to want to serve him like never before. You will find stuff to do. I don't, even, I don't know. Um, I don't see him right now, but I know he's here because I've seen him this morning. But we have a guy that joined a couple weeks ago named Jonathan Major. He's probably going to be mad at me for bringing him out in the sermon, but I love, just love the fact that as he's growing, you know what he says to me all the time? What can I do? I want, I want to do, give me something to do for God. I want to do something for the church. I want to do something for the Lord. What can I, what can I do? When you, when you realize there's nothing you can do, all you want to do is everything you can do for the Lord. This morning, I believe there's some people in this room that, You've been trying to earn your marks with God. And maybe today you've realized, I can't. I'm just going to come as I am. I'm going to say yes to Jesus. I'm going to give him my life, and I'm going to start serving him. And, and you need to do that. But for some of you in this room, at some point in time, you were, <laughs> you were walking with the Lord. You were serving God. You may have been faithful in church. You may have, and, and I don't know what happened. Something happened. Something changed in your mind. Something changed in your heart. But for a long time now, you've been like the prodigal in the story, in the Gospels about the, the prodigal son who was, he left his, left his home. You know the amazing thing about that story? The Bible tells us every day the father was waiting. Every day. And one day he said, I'm going home. And the father was waiting and the father wrapped his arms around him, and he loved him. And here's what we get from the story. It was as if he had never left. He didn't have to go back and start over. He was ready to be a servant. He didn't have to do that. And if you at one point in your life were serving the Lord faithfully, and whatever happened, it doesn't matter. God never stopped loving you, and he never stopped standing with his arms open, hoping and longing for the day that you would come back. Maybe today is that day. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your love and grace to us. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. But we're so thankful for it. Give us the courage this morning to do what it is that we need to do. It can be so difficult to do the right thing for you. Thank you, God, for all that you've done. This is your time. Let's stand together. Here's the invitation this morning. We've got some people standing in the back. You don't even have to come up front, but if you want somebody to pray with you, all you got to do is walk back there. If you want to tell them what you need prayer for, that you can. If not, you just stand there. They will begin to pray for you. If you've got a...